presentation. Are we live? Yes, all it is. Yeah, so uh, Thank you for the invitation to talk today about the surgical challenges of diverticular disease. There's been a sea change in our understanding of diverticular disease over the past decade, and a number of things have changed, not least things like the nomenclature. And the recent European Society of Color Proctology guidelines published in colorectal disease have highlighted some of the things that have changed including the concept of symptomatic, uncomplicated diverticular disease. Things have moved on a long way since the initial descriptions of diverticular disease um, and the classification that Hinchy described back in the 1970s. And we now find ourselves in a situation where we have widespread use of CT scanners to help us in our diagnosis of patients with acute diverticulitis. There have been several attempts to classify the CT appearances, but none of them have uh, achieved uh, widespread general acceptance. What we can say is that when intraoperative hinge classification has been correlated to uh, the uh, CT reports, that we find that the accuracy of diagnosis is not as good as we would hope. And we can see that particularly for hinge grade three, over which there is much debate about the management, the accuracy is only around 70%. And the inter and intra observer variability of CT classifications are as yet unknown. Having said that, many of the studies over the past decade have tried to differentiate between uncomplicated and complicated uh, diverticulitis. And to that end, the Wasbury modification of the Hinchy classification has been widely used to that end. One of the key questions that have been asked over the past decade was whether patients with uncomplicated diverticulitis needed antibiotics or not, or whether they could be managed just with observation. There were two randomized controlled trials conducted to try and answer this question, and this systematic review published in BGS earlier this year is an individual patient data meta-analysis which combines the data from both trials together. You can see that the groups are very well matched. And when looking at the outcomes between them, there are no real significant differences between the two groups, except for the length of hospital stay, which was longer in the patients who were having intravenous antibiotics. Consequently, the ESCP guidelines have stated that in patients with acute and complicated diverticulitis, they do not require antibiotics routinely and it should really only be reserved for those who are immunocompromised or with sepsis. So what about those who've got complicated diverticulitis? Well, a number of studies have tried to answer that question, particularly those which uh, look at patients with Hinchy 1B and Hinchy class 2 um, pericolic abscesses. And the systematic review from Jacob Rosenberg's team in Copenhagen has collated the evidence from non-randomized studies together. It's worth noting that uh, those patients who were treated just with antibiotics tended to have smaller abscess sizes than those who were treated with percutaneous uh, drainage. And also those just on antibiotics were more likely to have hinge one b disease. Nevertheless, in all groups, treatment seemed to fail approximately 20% of the time. And of those who were managed conservatively initially with just antibiotic treatment or indeed with percutaneous guided drainage, uh, approximately 25% got recurrent. And so overall, your long-term success with this non-operative management strategy is only about 60%. And for those who do undergo surgery, the mortality rate is high at 12%. 
Now, about these abscesses, what's the best way to treat them? Well, whether to have a drain or not can be influenced by the size of the abscess. We know that patients who are on antibiotics alone, if the abscess is greater than three centimetres in size, they're much more likely to have treatment failure in this large multicenter study of patients undergoing non-surgical management. Patients whose abscesses are greater than five centimetres in size are more likely to have their percutaneous drain fail to control the infection and they required surgery. There remains some uncertainty regarding the best treatment for pericolic abscesses in patients with acute diverticulitis. And so the European Society of Color Proctology have issued a statement which says that although the role of percutaneous drainage is not completely clear, it may be considered in those with abscesses greater than three centimetres. It's because of this uncertainty that there are still ongoing research studies to try and elucidate exactly what is the best way to manage such patients. And this large international multicenter uh, observational study was launched this week. Damascus has got centres recruiting in North America, Europe, the United Kingdom, Australasia, indeed all around the globe. And if anyone in India would like to help participate, please get in touch. Uh, with the email address on the screen. So what group of patients need surgery? Well, if we've managed Hinchy 1A with just observation 1B and 2 with antibiotics plus or minus percutaneous, percutaneous guided drainage, how do we measure, uh, how do we manage Hinchy Three patients. Well, certainly some studies have opined that if they are stable and immunocompetent, then they too could be managed just with antibiotics, and over half could avoid an operation. And certainly the ESCP guidelines seem to support observing those immunocompetent and hemodynamically stable patients uh, who have got perforation and signs of extra luminal air. Surgery should be considered for those who are hemodynamically unstable or frankly septic. But what to do in some of those patients? Well, in those who've got fecal peritonitis, it's a surprisingly evidence-free zone in terms of randomized controlled trials with uh, no clear evidence to guide us what to do. And so to that end, the ESCP guidance has suggested that the surgical approach should be related to the experience of the operating surgeon. What about those patients with purulent peritonitis? Does laparoscopic lavage have a role? Well, this concept has been around since the dawn of laparoscopy in the early 1990s. And essentially, there have been three randomized controlled trials which have tried to answer the question as to whether laparoscopic lavage is as good as primary resection when one considers whether there are further interventions. And we can see from the forest plot on the screen that patients who underwent reception were much less likely to have further interventions compared to those who had laparoscopic lavage. The groups were well matched in all the studies. And if you look at secondary outcomes, such as post-operative intensive care unit admissions, 30-day mortality and so on, doesn't appear to be a great deal of difference between the groups. What happens in a situation outside of a randomised control trial when you put the technique into the hands of a wider group of surgeons with a wider group of patients? Well, this prospective multicenter study examined just that question and found that long-term success occurred in approximately two-thirds of patients and that the indicators for failure of such a treatment strategy were due to the identification of free colonic perforation. Those patients were unlikely to do well just with lavage. And so the ESCP statement that laparoscopic lavage is feasible in selected patients has been made, but it's a relatively um, cautious statement. And what has never been examined is whether the patients who have got better with laparoscopic lavage 
got the same group of HG3 patients. Two minutes to go. French data was suggesting would have got better just with IV antibiotics. So those who do need surgery, what's the best way forward? Is it to do Hartman's procedure, which was the standard of care from the 1950s onwards, and then consider reversal at a later date? Or do we do a resection, wash out of the colon on table, primary anastomosis, and a defunctioning of the epileostomy? There have been four randomized controlled trials which have examined this question, and this recent meta-analysis provides a synopsis. What we can see is that the groups tend to be well matched. And when you look at either morbidity or mortality, there seems to be no difference in those patients who had a primary anastomosis and those who had a non-restorative resection. And when you look at what happens when you restore gastrointestinal continuity, we can see that it strongly favours um, those who had primary anastomosis because closing a loop ileostomy is a lot less challenging than reversing Hartman's, particularly in terms of morbidity. And we know this because repeated um, uh, series describing reversal of Hartman's have all demonstrated how difficult it can be. With low rates of uh, patients having it completely achieved laparoscopically, we still find that uh, more than one in five require temporary loop ileostomies and over half have a significant morbidity. Yet, despite the evidence and the approval of ESCP about using primary anastomosis with or without diverted loop ileostomy, we can see that it really hasn't penetrated into the colorectal community with low rates of uptake, as illustrated by this data from North America. What happens after the patients have finished their acute episode? What do they need in terms of follow-up? Is anything required? Well, it depends upon whether the initial index admission was for uncomplicated or complicated acute diabetes. One minute to go. The rates of colorectal cancer in the uncomplicated group are very low, whereas those with complicated acute diverticulitis, the rate of colorectal cancer is somewhat higher. And so for that group, endoscopic follow-up is still recommended. So in summary, diverticular disease remains one of the most complex conditions we treat. The decision-making is complex and it can have a profound influence on the morbidity and mortality of our patients. It's technically challenging surgery, whether it's done lap or open, and the guidelines that we have are a helpful synopsis of the evidence for best practice. Thank you. So thank you, thank you, Dr. Smart and uh, Professor Smart, and uh, for that wonderful presentation. There was one question. I think we have time only for one, and the questions are asked about he has uh, the uh, situation which a uh, delegate has mentioned in the question answer box, saying that he has one uh, he has a perforation at the angle. I am not sure what he means by the angle. Uh, so. Uh, can uh, he has perforation and obstruction at the angle? Uh, so, what do you think? What would be your solution to it, Professor Smart? And exactly what they mean by the angle. Um, but usually, if it's the angle of the uh, descending and sigmoid, or if it's the angle of the rectum and sigmoid, where the joint. I normally, if they've got um, perforation there, then I would go for um, resection personally. Depends upon the stability of the patient hemodynamically. Um, and often, if they are stable enough, I would like to do a primary resection and anastomosis. I have to say, I'm a big fan of on table colonic washouts, primary anastomosis, and defunctioning loop ileostomy uh, because I find it far easier to close a loop ileostomy than putting Hartman's resections back together again which inevitably is um, a thankless task with several hours of adhesiolysis beforehand, which is not fun if you're doing it either open or laparoscopic, it has to be said. So um, my preference is to resect an anastomose where at all possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Smart. Uh, 
and uh, that is all time we have for i'm sure there will be a lot of questions in the uh, question box can we move on to the next presentation please for joining in this prestigious indo uk sajikon and thank you organizers for giving me this opportunity i'm here to talk about quality of life issues post cancer surgery and why so simple because we are the land of the kama sutra where jokes apart my friend saklani actually did this audit in kata memorial hospital and nearly 75% of the patients are between the age group of 40 to 60 years this is a young population a productive age group and hence definitely quality of life has a big role to play post surgery is sexual function important for patients we sometimes do not think that it is important but if you really go and ask them it definitely turns out to be an important issue in their life this was a brazilian study which uh, found out that nearly 80% patients consider it either important or the most important factor of their life what about permanent stoma impacting quality of life permanent stoma obviously has a negative impact there are psychological marital and social lives are impaired there are limitations in daily activity a simple thing like praying to god becomes a big issue because there are various social taboos regarding the stoma it is financially draining we have no idea what the stoma back costs and it is really financially draining for them and hence every serious colorectal unit should have a stoma nurse with them counseling becomes extremely important in order to help patients who have to go ahead with permanent stoma irrespective of whatever we do and where stoma can be avoided it should be avoided third the most important thing for quality of life is the low anterior resection syndrome or lars now for surgeons what is lars very simple disordered bowel function leading to a detriment in quality of life now look at it from a patient's point of view and it is completely different my surgeon explained the possibility of lars as a quality of life issue and i had no idea how difficult it would be and so for the patients lars is a very very big deal now what is how is lars lars varies from 40 to 80% in patients depend uh, depending on various sources in the literature it is measured by scores like wexner and the lars score essentially there is incontinence bowel frequency and an influence on overall quality of life there are some factors which independently affect lars where whichever surgery you do age more than 70 years tumor distance from the external anal verge new adjuvant treatment especially radiation has known to be negatively impacting lars interval time of the closing the stoma if you wait for too long sometimes the incidence of lars is higher and sometimes comorbidities like diabetes also negatively impact i would urge uh, serious uh, students of colorectal surgery to read this article from professor narimantas from lithuania we know he has a huge body of work superb article recently appeared in uh, scientific reports in february how do you manage lars well it is a management basically consisting of kegels exercises judicious use of medications like isabgol and imodium stool training biofeedback and most importantly counseling managing stress because stress is caused by lars and lars is caused by stress so that vicious cycle has needs to be broken there are dietary changes that are important eat small frequent meals plenty of fluids foods that help to form up stools like white rice bread potato etc and avoiding foods like carbonated beverages beer milk nuts and certain vegetables like cabbage all this goes a long way in order to manage lars now what is the important factor as surgeons we can do to improve quality of life and for that to paraphrase bill clinton's famous slogan it is the nerves the autonomic nervous system is what is the most important thing and what is this autonomic nervous system basically it's a bunch of nerves which originates which have two origins one the sympathetic supply coming from the t10 to l2 where it gives off a branch to the inferior hypogastric nerve which is a mixed nerve which also takes branches from the uh, from the plexus from s2 to s4 giving parasympathetic output and ultimately supplies all the genital urinary structures in the pelvis so that is what forms the uh, autonomic nervous system and if you see it from a surgical anatomy perspective it is uh, the superior hypogastric plexus forms somewhere uh, near the origin of the inferior mesenteric artery and then along the pelvic rim are the hypogastric nerves and then 
at uh, the seminal vesicles or at the vaginal wall is the inferior hypogastric plexus. So that is where the surgical anatomy is. Now, where are the nerves that can get injured? Incidentally, there is a lot of articles in urology which actually talk about sexual dysfunction and bladder dysfunction post-rectal cancer surgery. So, a lot of urologists keeping a watch on us. So, let us be, let us, we have to really pull up our, uh, our, um, our sleeves and see to it that we do a better job at that. Because these are the areas where nerves could get injured. For example, during the dissection of the IMA, and what does it cause? It can cause a retrograde ejaculation and stress urinary incontinence. If it gets injured at lateral dissection, it can lead to incontinence and problems with ejaculation and erection. And if it gets injured at the inferior hypogastric plexus, then it can lead to impotence and erectile dysfunction in males. And in females, it can lead to dyspareunia and reduced genital lubrication. So a lot of impact at each level, the impact is different. Now, how do we save these nerves. Now, for example, when you're talking about the superior hypogastric plexus, uh, a lot of times we talk a lot about high ligation, low ligation, but we never talk about what impact it has on the nerves. So one thing we could do is when we enter into that holy plane of heel, leave a little bit of that thin areolar tissue over the nerves. This is the angel hair that you can see of the PME plane, and you can see the nerve here, which is covered by thin areolar tissue. Second, as you go on to the artery, remember that even if we are doing a uh, high ligation, if you leave, take out all the fibro fatty lymphatic tissue and leave about one to two centimeters from the origin, the superior hypogastric plexus is going to be thankful to you. Now, next is how do you save the hypogastric ner nerves and the branch to the hypogastric nerve? Now, here, uh, as we go into the TME plane, we should remember that there is a nice plane that does exist between the mesorectal envelope and the nerve, and it needs to be teased out. Gentle, blunt, and sharp dissection, as you can see here, the nerve is being dissected. In our zeal to identify the ureter, a lot of times we disregard the nerve, and the man ends up getting erectile or ejaculation problems. So this is, this is something that we need to keep in mind. The third is self saving the pelvic plexus. Now, this was a very low anterior resection, and this is typically the area where you can actually injure the nerves. Now, we have dissected. Uh, if you can, if you will see here, both the nerve and the ureter has been dissected. We have now retracted the seminal vesicles here, and now we follow the nerve and keep a small play, uh, nice fascia over the seminal vesicles, which essentially protects the plexus. And that is one way that we can help keeping the man's potency. Now, does approach make a difference? There, is, there are literature reports which say that the incidence of urinary and sexual dysfunction after open TME is significantly high. So laparoscopic approach does have an advantage here. And I think it is simply because of the kind of vision that you get in laparoscopy magnified. The nerves really come out well, much better than in open surgery. And more so in robotic surgery, as my chairperson, uh, Dr. Venki, would agree that in robotic surgery, your nerves really look very nice. And uh, it is much easier to preserve the nerves. And that has been the findings in some, uh, some literature reports as well. Uh, does type of procedure matter? I'm sure it does. There are no RCTs to prove that, but lateral pelvic node dissection or an extra levator AP, definitely the incidence of nerve injury is definitely more and can lead to decreased quality of life. We did our own study for quality of life in patients. We used the EORTC, QLQC30 and CRC29 questionnaires for the same. And uh, out of an entire pool of 500 patients, only 84 were willing to talk. This was retrospective data, telephonic interviews which were taken. We had sexual dysfunction in 20% compared to the literature average of 40 to 50%. Uh, urinary dysfunction in 10%, diarrhea in 20%, and pain in 23%. So nearly one in five patients does end up with some kind of dysfunction uh, after low anterior resection surgery. As far as uh, uh, the uh, age is concerned, with increasing age, there was a little increase in the symptoms, not statistically significant, but definitely more. Uh, rest of the uh, findings, as far as international literature, Lysentis was the largest trial we encountered, was similar. 
uh, if you see uh, the symptoms as well, except for constipation, which was higher in European patients, uh, the rest of the symptoms were the same. The rest of the problems were the same as far as rectal cancer surgery is concerned. Now, if you go by T stage, that is one thing we compared. Uh, most of the symptoms were more as far as T stage is concerned. Obviously, more extensive dissection leading to more uh, more incidence of uh, uh, post uh, surgery symptoms. Uh, end staging also showed a similar uh, correlation, not statistically significant, but everything is more in N plus patients, uh, including financial difficulties were more. Obviously, N plus patients are going to require more intense chemotherapy. They uh, could have more recurrences. Uh, there are more problems. Definitely, uh, then that is why the quality of life is poorer. So to conclude, uh, quality of life parameters are comparable to Western literature and there is deterioration in parameters with advancing age and stage, though it is not statistically significant. So what should we do as surgeons? One, pre-op assessment is extremely important. We need to know that this patient will have more incidence of something like LARS. We have seen the prognostic factors that are there. We should have a structured training and exposure to pelvic neuroanatomy. Now, we talk a lot to our residents about preserving the ureters and vascular control and how there are complications. Nobody talks about the nerves because that is something that happens when the patient goes home. Exposure is extremely important. As I said, we are dealing with a young population and hence preserving the nerves and quality of life is very important. Obvious advantage of minimal access surgery. We must increase training opportunities. You are all uh, seniors here and an organization like uh, IGS to take this to where laparoscopy is not there and improve the penetration of laparoscopic surgery, which currently in India is very low. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, any questions, I would love. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, all. If there are no questions, uh, we will move on to our uh, next presentation. Uh, Thanks for the, all the organizing committee yeah. so the next, uh, next for his invitation to participate to the third international and uh, mid-term uh, virtual conference um, to speak on uh, transanal TME for rectal cancer and uh, to discuss if it is a procedure that will stay in the future. Uh, it is a, a procedure proposed as a method to improve uh, surgery of mid and low rectal cancer. It's a hybrid TME using a minimally invasive abdominal approach by laparoscopy or robotic and transanal approach. It has the potential to be safer for the distal resection margin as proposed in the 80s by uh, Gerald Marx for distal tumor. In uh, type 1 lesion, the tumor located more above 2 cm from the anorectal junction, it is the best indication uh, because we can uh, uh, do uh, approach with a platform in place at the beginning of the procedure, avoiding a local contamination risk. But for the tumor lower than uh, two centimeters, uh, the operative platform cannot be introduced immediately. We have to dissect distal first. We have to differentiate different types, but all um, with a tumor reaching uh, two centimeters uh, the distance of the anorectal uh, junction or less, we have to do either a sleeve mucosectomy or partial intersphincteric resection or total intersphincteric resection, depending on type 1, B, 2, or 3. Uh, when uh, we have this type of tumor, we have to take care with the risk of local contamination by cancer cells. And we will see that this is a risk of uh, a local recurrence rate. And uh, we can say if 
so laparoscopy consisted uh, transalatiemi is uh, considered is considered as a common technique actually we have problem there is no consensus to say what we have to do first beginning by transanal way or beginning by transabdominal to do a panoramic exploration and evaluate the possibility to do the surgical procedure. And uh, when we have to stop the abdominal step too, for uh, um, Dapri, uh, um, uh, Giovanni, uh, he proposed to stop one centimeter down the promontory. But I will say why not continuing if it's easy uh, to do all the procedure by transabdominal. Abdominal. Uh, a procedure mixing both, uh, doing transanal and uh, transabdominal, uh, we do since a long time. This is a case with a single port in uh, uh, the right iliac fossa for doing the dissection of the vessels to do the mobilization of the sigmoid and um, uh, splenic flexure and doing uh, by, uh, transanal ways uh, uh, perirectal dissection. And we can have a procedure with one scar uh, for the diverting and protective stoma. So there is a big difference with the pure transanal I, I promote 10 years ago and proposed to do it is a pure notes rectal TME technique. Uh, the, without laparoscopic assistance. We do all the procedure by transanal way. The best indications are for tumor located more than two centimeters from the anorectal junction, the type 1A lesion, with a long sigmoid loop because we will have sufficient space available to allow an endoscopic purse string placement with the adequacy of the distal margin, about one centimeter distal to the tumor. We begin with a team between the leg and we will close the distal rectum, performing a purse string, a full thickness per string with uh, monofilament to zero sutures, uh, one centimeter distal to the distal margin of the tumor. Then uh, we do a posterior incision and we will uh, dissect the presacral space um, back to the propria fascia of the rectum. There we will do lateral dissection uh, between the sidewall fascia and the perirectal fascia. We open the, the space and we will divide all the structure crossing the space coming from lateral to the going to the rectum and uh, we dissect medial to the sidewall fascia that is protected, the distal plexus, um, pelvic plexus, is protected by the sidewall fascia and we will only divide the neurovegetative branches crossing this space to go to the rectum. On right, on left, and this is how we can uh, do a safe uh, protection of the plexus. Then we continue anterior. We open the um, uh, Douglas pouch, and uh, it's easy in uh, female patient, but in male, we have to dissect uh, um, uh, to uh, behind the prostate and the. Uh, urethra with a uh, high danger, particularly after irradiation, that is for me not the best indication uh, for uh, operating uh, during the transanal uh, approach. And uh, we will uh, dissect the um, plexus branch running posteriorly to the root of the mesosigmoid. We will dissect from down to up. And we continue the dissection anterior to the uh, aorta and um, down to up. We will see the iliac vessels, 
then we will see the entire aspect of the aorta and we will reach the um, uh, root of uh, the um, mesosiguid and the origin of the IME. And uh, in this case, as you see, we see the left colic artery. We have reached pushing the long uh, TO um, um, platform. Uh, the origin of the IME, we see the left colic artery, the sigmoid trunk and the superior rectal artery and we will do a division in this case uh, distal to uh, the left colic. Then we do the extraction of the specimen and uh, we do uh, transanally and we verify the quality of uh, the specimen to uh, be sure that we did a good oncologic resection. Anastomosis will be performed after doing end-to-end -end mechanical anastomosis, side-to-hand with um, um, uh, hemorrhoid uh, stapler, long shaft, uh, or uh, manually uh, doing side-to-hand or end-to-hand -end anastomosis. Results. Um, the results, there is actually, there is today no randomized evidence for the benefit doing a transanal TME. Uh, we have equivalent oncologic results. We have similar anastomotic leak in uh, positive resection margin rates. But we have a long learning curve for doing this and it is uh, published in the literature as a long surgical procedure with worst outcome um, seen in the first 50 cases performed. It is why um, the Norwegian colorectal cancer group have uh, found high recurrence rate after transanal TME with a possibility related to the rectal transection airflow during the dissection. And uh, they decide in December 2018 to stop performing this type of procedure, waiting, uh, uh, following the Norwegian Health Authority, uh, um, declaring a national moratorium for transanal TME, and waiting until the national audit will be complete. They evocate the problem of the learning curve for these procedures. That's why some team has uh, Samatala structured training program for this type of procedures. And they tra it trained um, 81 surgeons during one year and evaluate um, uh, morbidity and technical problem after this course completion. And the problem they have um, found signif um, significant um, procedure compli uh, complication reported uh, by the respondent. And it was uh, particularly the urethral injury, whereby 25% respond this. Uh, it is why he concludes that it was useful for the majority of the surgeon, but uh, due to the complexity of the procedure, it's not sufficient to train surgeons with this approach. Transanal TME technique still have many problems, high technical difficulty, high dependency of device platform, limited indication. Therefore, it will take a long time for this technique to be widely applied in clinical practice. But we can say, yes, this will be used uh, for selected cases, but after a long training of the team. Thank you for your attention and take care of you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for... Uh giving such a nice uh, talk the you're a legend in laparoscopy and maybe now transanal procedures also just one question uh, what is the what is your comment on upon the uh, the norwegian moratorium uh, do you think it is justified do you think it will change things or do you think it will go away uh, uh, yes i think it's, uh, it is uh, justified why because 
I, I, I was traveling around the world. Uh, actually, it's more limited. And what I have seen, it's not really uh, what I want to be the patient. Uh, because, uh, you see, people without training are doing surgery, but I'm not sure it is a standardized procedure. And we know that the results in surgery, in medical care, are due to a good procedure, well performed. And people are saying they do TATME, but they mix. It is why I have tried to show they mix up to down and down to up. But we do that since always. When it's difficult, we do distal um, uh, dissection to have a, um, a low, um, more preservation of the sphincter. And it is a recommendation of uh, Gerald Marx and after his son, uh, John Marx, and Gerald Marx did that open. Um, uh, in the 80s, um, previous century. So this is, uh, uh, we have to know how to do transanal dissection. We have to know to, how to do um, um, up to down dissection. But remember, uh, we have never seen so many complications since we do transanal TME uh, as we see actually in the world. Never, never we have seen so many urethral complications, for example, and we don't know all the case. Absolutely true, sir. I think uh, good mentoring, good uh, practice and a good knowledge of anatomy is extremely important for this procedure, more so than any other procedure. That's what I feel. Thank you very much, Professor Leroy. So kind Thanks. of you to join us and give you a valuable time. Thanks. Uh, Thank you. Take care, sir. And uh, we move on to our last presentation of this session uh, from Dr. Ashwin de Souza, who's, uh, uh, who's a professor at uh, Tata Memorial Hospital. Ashwin, over to you. Thank you for this opportunity to present on pushing the boundaries in advanced spectral cancer. We have gone beyond the standard TME approach to push boundaries towards uh, organ preservation, improving local and systemic control, increasing sphincter preservation, adopting minimally invasive resections, performing lateral pelvic lymph node dissection, and finally adopting extended and beyond TME for locally advanced and recurrent rectal cancers. This last boundary is going to be the subject of my talk today. Let me begin by defining extended TME by an end block partial resection of the adjacent involved organs along with the TME specimen in order to achieve an R0 resection. If one were to adopt, uh, resect the entire organ, one would adopt a beyond TME approach, uh, resecting according to defined templates for pelvic excentration. Also included in this group is the extralevator APR. What is the need for an extended or beyond TME approach? The first indication is one for T4B cancers, which can occur in five to 10% of rectal cancers at presentation. In such situations, one would have to extend the surgical template beyond the mesorectal fascia or adopt a beyond TME approach. The second situation is that in recurrent rectal disease, where 6 to 13 percent of patients may have disease only in the pelvis that is amenable to surgical salvage. However, as the TME planes have been violated in this setting, one would have to adopt an extended TME approach. The surgical options depend on the quadrant of the pelvis that is involved with disease. For posterior disease, one would have to adopt various types of sacral resection. For lateral disease, the extralevator APR and extended lateral pelvic sidewall excision. And for anterior disease, uh, defined templates for pelvic excentration. Let me briefly describe each of these approaches and the results associated with them. For posterior disease involving the low sacrum, we have a low sacrectomy. As we see here, disease involving the coccygeous muscle and the sacrum right at the S5 vertebra. We performed a low sacrectomy at the S4, S5 disc to achieve an R0 resection. Little more advanced case in the recurrent setting, disease going into S2, 3, 4 uh, bodies. 
we had to adopt a high sacrectomy, which is defined as at or above the S2, S3 disc. On close examination of the actual view, we see the S2 nerve root is involved with disease, but the S1 and the L4, L5 nerve roots are free. We were able to save both uh, S1 and L4, L5 nerve roots and uh, maintain function in both lower limbs. Other options for less uh, in advanced disease are the high subcortical sacrectomy where in patients with bone invasion less than 10 millimeters and disease medial to the sacral foramina, an R0 resection can be achieved by resecting the anterior sacral cortex. The next is the partial anterior sacrectomy where the anterior elements are resected, preserving the nerve roots and the posterior sacral elements. And finally, the high sacral segmental disconnection, resecting the hemisacrum which is involved along with the involved nerve roots. The largest published series of NMAR sacrectomy along with pelvic excentration is from uh, Michael Solomon's group in Australia. And they report on 100 pelvic excentrations with sacrectomy, majority done for recurrent rectal cancer. Looking briefly at the demographics, we see that nearly a third had a high sacrectomy. R0 resection was achieved in 72 patients. These are lengthy operations averaging about 10 hours and four and a half liters. No 30 day in hospital mortality and hospital stay was nearly a month. If we compare high and low sacrectomy, High sacrectomy is expectedly associated with a longer operating time, more blood loss, and higher incidence of neurological deficit. But at experience centers such as this, there was no difference in R0 resection or complication rates. They present overall survival of 38% and disease free survival of 30% at five years, which is quite impressive considering that this is a current rectal disease in the majority of patients. Factors negatively influencing survival were involved margins, lymph node involvement, and anterior organ invasion. High sacrectomy, uh, though associated with higher incidence of neurological deficit, did not influence the R0 resection or the survival. Lateral disease is probably the most difficult compartment to tackle because of the internal iliac vascular system, leading to the possibility of catastrophic hemorrhage, and the nerve roots along the pelvic sidewall which can be injured or sacrificed, leading to neurological dysfunction. All this in the setting of redo surgery and radiation damaged tissues. The plane of resection of the lateral pelvic sidewall depends on the extent of disease involvement. We can see the mesorectal plane adopted for a standard TME and the vascular plane along the vessels of the internal iliac system, a muscular plane further lateral involving the obturator internus and the bony plane of resection, removing some part of the bony pelvis. A patient of ours, a 36 year old gentleman with disease going into the right pariformis muscle, we adopted a template of resecting the internal iliac artery and vein along with the medial aspect of the pariformis, an intraoperative picture showing the obturator nerve, the external iliac artery and vein, the ligated internal iliac artery, the distal end of the internal iliac vessels, the sacral nerve roots, the sacrospinous ligament and the piriformis muscle, part of which has been resected along with the specimen. The largest series of lateral pelvic sidewall dissection during pelvic excentration uh, again goes to the credit of Michael Solomon and his group from Australia, where they report on 200 end block iliac vessel excisions performed over a series of nearly 400 pelvic excentrations over 20 years. Majority of these patients were for recurrent rectal cancer. 14% had vascular reconstruction, 13% sciatic nerve resection, and 11% ischium resection. Complications were slightly higher, 82% as compared to sacrectomy, major complications being nearly 30%. The R0 resection rate was quite impressive, nearly 70%, and it is interesting to note that the R0 resection rate improved from 20% to 66% over this 20-year period by routinely adopting a more lateral anatomical plane. Anterior disease is tackled with the standard template pelvic excentrations. We have the anterior and posterior excentrations defined in the female pelvis, the anterior excentration being mainly for uh, carcinomas of the cervix and the bladder, 
the supraelevator pelvic excentration preserving the sphincter complex and the total pelvic excentration. All of these can be combined with uh, varying extents of resection of the pelvic sidewall and the bony pelvis. The most comprehensive results for pelvic excentration have been published by the Pelvex Collaborative Group. This is data from 27 international institutions across 14 countries over a 10 year period. And it is interesting to look at the results of uh, pelvic excentration in the primary and the recurrent setting, both side by side. If you look at the demographics, we see that majority do get new adjuvant therapy and the template of resection of uh, pelvic excentration is more or less the same in the primary and the recurrent setting in these two series. The duration of surgery is about an hour longer in the recurrent setting expectedly due to the increased technical difficulty. However, blood transfusion was is more or less similar, but the R0 resection rate, which is nearly 80% in the primary setting, falls down to 55% in the recurrent setting. Morbidity is more or less the same with major complications being 37% in the primary setting and 32% in the recurrent setting. It is the R0 resection that offers the survival advantage both in the primary and the recurrent setting. R0 resection is associated with a 56% three-year overall survival in the primary setting, falling down to just 8% if we do an R2 resection. And we see a similar trend of results in the recurrent setting as well. Factors predicting overall survival include the R0 resection rate, both in the primary and the recurrent setting, the incidence of nodal positivity in the primary setting, and whether or not bone is resected as part of the template in the recurrent setting. Resecting bone for a recurrent rectal cancer uh, is associated with probably higher R0 resection rate as shown in the series, 67% versus 56%. Looking at our own experience of extended TME at the Tata Memorial Center in Mumbai, over a nine year period, we performed 118 extended TMEs and we can see the various templates of resection depending on the quadrants involved. We also performed 259 pelvic excentrations during this period, mainly for primary rectal adenocarcinoma. We have in our population, patients tend to be of lower BMI. A majority of our procedures are open, but we did manage to offer minimally invasive pelvic excentration in 25% of patients, and 12 patients had an NMAS low sacrectomy. We chose fit patients for this procedure, average a liter and a half blood loss, a hospital stay of 12 days, and a complication rate of 52%. We did have 1% mortality in this series, which is quite comparable to the pelvic data. We are able to achieve a 90% R0 resection in our series, and the pathological T4 is 46%, which is also comparable to reported data. We are looking at long-term outcomes in our data. An R0 pelvic excentration definitely offers a survival advantage, but is life worth living following this morbid procedure? Let's look at a systematic review evaluating quality of life following pelvic excentration. And we see that quality of life does return to pre-surgical levels about six to nine months following the procedure. And if one were to compare quality of life between APR and total pelvic excentration, Although in the immediate post-operative period, the quality of life favors APR, after about four months, this difference is dissipated. To sum up, the surgical approach for uh, locally advanced or rectal, uh, recurrent rectal cancer depends on the quadrant of involvement of the pelvis. These are specialized procedures with high morbidity but low mortality at experience centers. The survival advantage is only if we can achieve an R0 resection and the quality of life does return to baseline and is comparable to APR. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashwin. Thank you. That was uh, that was a great presentation. Very impressive data. Uh, one question, uh, which is actually uh, I to I feel it is to Professor Leroy, is uh, how do you identify the superior and the inferior hemorrhoidal vessels? That's from the from the from the audience. Uh, 
एंड डू यू लाइक इट और क्लिप और बस दैट्स द क्वेश्चन आई प्रिज्यूम इट इज टू प्रोफेसर लेरॉय Yes, I am switch on. Emory, Emory vessels. Yes. Yeah, I mean that is the question. I guess it, they mean whether you by doing a transal probably do you take the superior rectal artery, and uh, is that uh, I presume that is the question. I'm so I don't think we can get it. Uh, but that's but, precisely the question. Yeah, no, you have to take care, but using I would say sealing sealing system sealing device now it's uh, easier than in the past. Uh, you have seen the dissection I did uh, with monopolar. Um, if there is big uh, um, hemorrhoid vessels, um, we have to use a sealing system. It's better than clipping because uh, clipping, when we will manipulate, uh, the clip can fall. So I prefer to use sealing system. Right, sir. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, one question to uh, uh, Professor Smart: uh, Do you use uh, anything special to identify the ureters when you are doing a complicated diverticulitis surgery? No, I haven't. And again, the um, European cytokeller proctology uh, guidelines do address this. And the question has been asked, what about things like prophylactic stenting? They are not routinely recommended. Um, I have to say, I can think of one case over the past five or six years where I have required ureteric stenting intraoperatively. But overall, it's not something that I routinely use or require. I know some people, uh, as was beautifully illustrated before, like in the uh, ureter to help highlight its path. But uh, whether that categorically reduces the rate of ure ureteral injuries um, is not established at this point in time. So it's not a routine practice, not yet. Ashwin, uh, one question for you. Uh, yeah. The procedures that you were you showed and talked about are very extensive. Uh, generally, Indian patients are not very good on GC. Do you think they tolerate this well? And uh, what what are the what is the preoperative care and optimization that you do? Yeah, actually, these patients are quite fitter than one would expect because uh, the patients that come up for surgery are the ones that only have the local recurrence. So they, uh, if they have systemic disease, they are no longer surgical candidates. So uh, as you see in our data, they are young patients with very localized uh, disease in the pelvis. But as it is mostly recurrent or it is a T4B lesion, it has transgressed the, uh, the mesorectal uh, TME plane. So these patients are quite fit, and uh, it is only the fit ones that we take up for these extensive resections. As you can see, the morbidity is quite significant, and uh, if they, we have no ASA three, uh, very few ASA two, majority ASA one. Uh, but if we do get an R zero resection, uh, these are definitely worth it. So we do go ahead. Yes. Thank you, thank you, Ashwin, and with this, uh, thank you all, Professor Smart, uh, Professor Leroy. Uh, Professor Ashwin, you are you have been very kind to give your valuable inputs for this session. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, and thank you for answering the questions. Uh, I would request uh, the uh, the coordinator to go on to the next set of uh, next session, which is which is also on papers.